It's about five years now, and some of you might even remember this because I'm sure you notice every detail about me. Anyway, uh, about five years ago at the doctor's urging uh, and finally my, my consent, I decided to, to, to lose some weight. And the doctor had actually rem- re- recommended that I give consideration to one of those low-carb diets. And he said, just pick one of them. There's a number of them out there. Just try one of them. And I don't know exactly how it was that I wound up uh, choosing this one, but I wound up going with the South Beach diet because, you know, that sounds, that sounds nice, right? Beachy. Um, anyway, South Beach uh, diet. In fact, I, I, I believe I actually mentioned this to you at one point before. I believe uh, perhaps in the series that I did on some of Satan's tools because I believe sincerely that Satan is the one that invented that particular diet plan. But how it works is that in particular for the first two weeks, it, there's almost zero carbs. I mean, and we're not talking about the, the normal stuff. Like, you, you know you can't have potatoes. You know you're not going to uh, be having a sandwich, especially with white bread. Uh, but this one was so profoundly strict. I mean, it was, it was stuff that you wouldn't, wouldn't think about. Of course, you can have meat, you can have cheese, but don't dare use any ketchup because ketchup was strictly forbidden, especially within those first couple of weeks. And um, anyway, I... I, I I decide early on, I'm, I'm just going to give this at least a shot. And somebody had given us, the, or lent us, the, the book that describes how this diet works. And I'm, I'm experiencing, thankfully, some weight loss in those first couple of weeks, but it's absolutely miserable. And in that process, I, I look in the book, and if you go like six months out, or like a year out, it says like, you, you can, for example, one night for supper, let's say it's Mexican night, you can have one flour tortilla. Ole. <laughs> one, like after six months, you can have one flour tortilla. And so at, at this point, I realized, you know what, I'm just going to, I'm going to stick with this for the first couple of weeks, and I'm going to have to do something different because I know I cannot stick to this. I can start this, but there's no way I can stick with this long term. Well, I was able in that two-week period and then the months that followed, I was able to lose a fair amount. But that was like five years ago. And so a week ago yesterday, I decided, you know what? I need to get back on the wagon because if I keep adding more weight, I'm going to need to be carried around in a wagon. And um, so I'm, I'm, I'm back on and I'm doing this low-carb thing. Not that one, but I'm doing some low-carb stuff now. And as I describe that experience, some of you can say, man, I know that story. Because it's not simply this question, have you ever been on a diet? It's how many diets have you ever done, right? You don't just do one. You do one, and then, I don't know, months later, years later, you do another one, and another one, and another one, and another one. And and why is that? It's because of this reality. So many times, it is easier for us to get on a program, to start a program, than it is to stay on program, isn't it? You know, over the past few weeks, we have been looking at and considering and giving thought to this whole idea of holiness. And we looked at two different aspects of it. We looked about the holiness of God. We talked about how, when we talk about the fact that God is holy, that that communicates that everything, among other things, he does is morally right. But beyond that, and to a far greater degree even than his moral purity, the fact that God is not simply greater than anyone and everything, he is distinctly in a class all by himself. He is set apart from any and all that exists. And so we talked about that, but then we thought about it over the past couple of weeks more personalized and what that has to do with us because our holy set-apart God has said both in Old and New Testaments to us the exact same thing, in fact uses the exact same words, be holy as I am holy morally right, set apart, as God is, he expects those of us who are his followers also to be set apart. It is sincerely my hope, and it's not because of the the prowess of my preaching or my skills at oratory or my intellect or my reasoning or any of that stuff. 
it is sincerely my hope that God has been able to use his word and his spirit to say something to you and your walk over the past few weeks. And it is my hope that God has helped you to see, you know what, there are some areas where my life, there, there are some spots of holiness, but my life is not morally right and set apart like God's is. There's sincerely room for improvement. But not just room for improvement, there's some real changes that I've got to make. And it's entirely possible, and it's my hope that some of you have already made some decisions and choices that are getting you in that direction. You've begun to make some choices and to make some decisions that are putting you essentially on a program where you are beginning increasingly to take serious the command of God to be holy as he is holy. But you have to bear this in mind. I'm not suggesting that it's easy to start the process. I am saying this, by comparison, it's much more difficult to stay with the process than it is to start it. Is that all that God is interested in is occasionally us having blips of holiness? That, that he just wants a few fits and spurts along the way where, okay, I'm going to try to do this for a while and then after a period of months or weeks even, sometimes even days, we just trail off. You know, God is interested, and my hope is that you are interested in the long term, that this is not a sprint, this is a, a marathon, and that the life he's called us to is one that is marked by making morally right decisions, but also living a life that's set apart. That's a long-term process. So how is it that we can not just begin and start the program, but we can actually stay on program? Look with me in your Bibles today to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, and we're going to start reading with verse 1. And so as you're turning there, let me set the context for you before we actually read what we're talking about. If you're to understand anything in the book of Hebrews, and for this book at all, this little letter to make any sense, you have to continuously keep in mind the context. That this is a letter that was written to Jewish Christians. So these are individuals who have grown up in and were steeped in since birth the law of Moses, rabbinical teaching, sacrifices and offerings, going to the temple and doing all of the stuff that we read in the Old Testament. And so that they are faithful Jews, but after the ministry and the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus, the message of Jesus comes to them, and they begin to hear about it. Maybe some of them even actually personally encountered Jesus. And they came to discover that Jesus was not simply a great teacher, not merely a miracle worker, and certainly far more than an attention getter. This is the one that we have been looking for forever. I mean, this is, this is God's promised deliverer that came to save us from our sins. And that we can have a personal connection with God when we trust what he did for us and that going forward, there's no more need for the sacrifices of bulls and goats because he's given for us the ultimate sacrifice. All right, so these are, are Jews who have heard that message and accepted by faith that message. And they are now Christians. More specifically, though, they are Jewish Christians. As Christians, however, that has put them in a difficult spot. It, it puts them on the receiving end of some official, at this point it's still kind of early, but some official persecution from Rome. And so the Roman government doesn't really like them, and it's getting ready to get really, really bad once Nero comes to the throne. But is, it's as if Roman persecution and opposition and ire and contempt was not enough they're now ostracized by their Jewish community sometimes it was even members of their own intimate close family friends neighbors folks that they've worked with for years all of a sudden are looking at these people that are Jewish Christians they look at them as effectively spiritual traitors you have turned your backs on Moses you've turned your backs on our people and you've turned to this nutcase Jesus and so we want nothing to do with you and they're absolutely shunned they are effectively cut off from society and so they're they're, they're taking heat and they're taking fire from their own people but then they're also taking fire from the Roman government so it's a tough spot 
to be in for sure. And when that's the case, what's the temptation? Well, the temptation is to say, um, you know, just kidding. Yeah, j- just kidding. Uh, yeah, that whole Jesus thing, oh, that was, uh, yeah, well, just, uh, yeah, scratch that. No, I am back with you. And so I'm going to leave all this Jesus stuff, this Christian stuff, this church stuff. I'm done with that, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be back over here with you so that you'll talk to me, so that, you know, I, I can buy stuff, and you'll buy my stuff at the marketplace so that, that we can have family get-togethers again. And so the temptation is for them to walk away from Jesus. And so this letter comes as an encouragement to them to say, stay with the program do not abandon this one that ultimately is the fulfillment of everything the law and prophets told us stay on program and so this letter has been going on for 11 chapters and finally we come to verse 12 which says therefore since we also have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the source and perfecter of our faith. For the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of God. Consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, so that you won't grow weary and give up. The writer of Hebrews is addressing these Jewish Christians and he's saying to them stay on the program stay on program and he's not just simply staying on the program of and ultimately his is a call to staying on the program of faith walking with God but the truth is the same principle applies the same principles apply to this whole idea of holiness what enables us to stick with the faith is the same thing that will enable us to stick with a path that leads us to experience what God called us to, to be holy as he is holy. But you say, well, okay, I've read that. Well, I don't see exactly where this intersects me. Well, let's break it down a little bit. Starting in verse 1, he says, since we are surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses. And what's that a reference to? Well, if you're at all familiar with the book of Hebrews, you may very well be familiar with what's going on in chapter 11. And chapter 11 is what's often described as the Faith Hall of Fame. And if you go back in that chapter, it starts essentially with Abel, and then it talks about Noah, and it talks about Abraham, it talks about Moses, it talks about Samuel, it talks about David, and and a whole slew of individuals in between, where these are individuals that are given as examples of faith. Not people who did this whole follower of God perfectly, But these were people who took their walk with God seriously, and God was able to work through and use them in significant ways. And so after having described the lives and the ministries of all of these people, we come to chapter 12, and the writer says, since we are surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses. It's entirely possible that whether in a message or in a Bible study at some point in the past, someone has said to you, hey, this great cloud of witnesses, these are friends and loved ones and other believers who are already now in heaven, and they're kind of operating like the grandstand of heaven cheering you on and they're saying yeah Michael go you can do this you got this the wind's at your back you can keep doing this and let me just tell you anyone who told you that I believe to be emphatically and enthusiastically and uproariously wrong I do not believe for one second I I candidly think it's bad doctrine and horrible horrible ideology to suggest that those who have gone on before are able to see what's going on now I do not believe that for one minute. And I believe that for a number of reasons. First of all, the Bible never once communicates to us that that's even remotely possible. So I believe it to be an erroneous, certainly non-biblically founded idea. But far beyond that, let me ask you this. When you and I or anyone is in heaven, what is going to be the grand object of focus? What is our attention going to be on in heaven? Well, it's, it's going to be a Godward gaze. We're going to be able to see the Lord face to face. The Lord himself is going to be the object of our attention. And think about how difficult that is made when when your spouse that's left behind, your children, your friends, your co-workers, your whoever, is still down here. You'd be like, oh, okay. What's... He's, is, he getting, is he getting remarried? <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, oh, holy, holy. What's he doing? She, she's... She's too skinny. (laughs) 
She's too young. What, what, what's going on? Or you look at your child and you say, I can't believe that they're doing this. There's, there's no way that I'm, uh, my, my heart is breaking watching this. Imagine the difficulty, if you're in heaven, being able to see all the screw-ups that we continue to make and, and think that somehow you're going to gonna, you're gonna be able to focus on the Lord. It's candidly impossible, and not only because it lacks biblical basis, but because I believe it's rooted in horrible, horrible, erroneous logic. I don't believe that anyone outside the Lord himself that's in heaven is able to know and observe what's going on down here. So who is this a reference to? I believe it's a reference to those who have gone on before that have been left for us as examples. So he says to, to, the, to the audience of Jewish believers in verse 1 of chapter 12, we're surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses, which is chapter 11. We've got all of these great heroes. We've got all of these great examples of people that took their walk with God seriously. So you've got all of these great examples in view. And not only do we have those same examples, we've got another 2,000 years worth of examples. We, we've got reformers, we've got the, the revivalists, we've got Sunday school teachers, we've got preachers, we've got friends, we've got individuals that God has shown his light through to us that are showing us of examples, not only of what could be, but should be. And since we have these great examples, we are called to do some things. He says... Let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. It's at this point that we begin to unpack this whole idea of staying on program. Not just starting, but staying on program. And what does it take to be able to do that? The first thing that you've got to do is this. You've got to get rid of the dead weight. You've got to get rid of the dead weight. Well, what is the dead weight? Well, he describes two things. He says the sin and those things, and lay, the sin that surrounds us, lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. So there's two things, sin and hindrances. I hope you understand that if you and I are going to take seriously this whole idea of being holy and living holy as he is holy, then there's sin that's got to go, Right? We cannot be set apart like God is set apart when we're holding on to and actively engaging in sin, right? So, so sin has to go. But honestly, that's the easiest thing to see, right? I mean, because there's a lot of things that God has said, hey, this, this thing, that thing, these various things, all of those are out of bounds. And so if we're going to measure up at all and take seriously the standard that God has called us to, sin has to go. That's easy to see. What's more difficult is what he describes as that which so easily ensnares us. So again, there's, there's two concepts. One, he's describing sin. So stuff that God has already said, that's out of bounds. But then there's other stuff that God has not expressly forbidden. There's stuff that in and of itself is not sin. Yet it can ensnare us. Well, what, what is it that might be able to ensnare us that's not necessarily wrong but is there anything wrong intrinsically with a tv now is there anything intrinsically wrong with having internet service is there anything intrinsically wrong with having a smartphone or having relationships with other people no th there's nothing intrinsically wrong with any of these things each of them can be positive and used for useful godly affirming experiences yet the TV, for example, can promote a number of things. I mean, for one thing, it can expose your mind to a worldview, to entertainment, to a perspective that runs counter to what God has said. I mean, re relationships with other people are absolutely not a wrong thing, but it's entirely possible that you can have relationships with people that those relationships bring out the absolute worst in you. It could be that they bring out the worst in you in the sense that it leads you to, you just get together and you just talk bad about other people. It leads you to just be a terrible gossip. But it could be that there's relationships that you can have with other people that lead you into temptation where you might compromise your sexual standards, standards that God has erected. I mean, there's nothing wrong with having internet service, but it could be that that internet service, especially unfiltered, unrestricted internet service, is, is leaving wide open 
an easy access door to pornography that very easily can ensnare you. What I'm saying is this. There's a lot of stuff in our lives that are not in and of themselves wrong. Yet they are things that can easily, so easily ensnare us. It was uh, a few years ago, maybe three years ago, I guess now. Caroline's mom came up and stayed with us for a few days, and I had taken her over to Sam's Club over on Windover, and we had just gotten back home. I've got the stuff in. She is coming into the kitchen, and I, I step out into the back. to I'm going to get the grill out and light it. And so I'm, I'm outside for just a few moments, and I come back in, and Caroline kind of jokingly says, Mama decided to lay down for a nap a little bit. And I look, and she's laying in the kitchen floor. And it turns out, long story short, what, what has happened is that she had had hip replacement surgery before, and when she went to undo her shoes, the hip actually came out of socket, and so she lands in the floor. Well, at this point, we don't know exactly what's going on. We didn't, we didn't know that that was going on. All I know is that she's laying in the floor, now, she's not, I mean, she's hurting, but she's not like crying or screaming or anything like that. And she's able to talk with us and being the, the encourager that I am. My first question was, is this when I sing the old gray mare? <laughs> Again, always the encourager. We are saying at this point, hey, I think we need to call an ambulance. And she's like, no, 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 if I can just get in a chair, I, I may be okay. L let me get in a chair first. But she says, you know, I, I, I can't get in the chair. And so what I do is I, I come around her with my nearly superhuman strength. And so I, I come around her like this, and I pick her up and set her in the chair. As this is going on, among other things, she is apologizing for this, for being dead weight. She says, I'm, I'm sorry for being just dead weight. Now, you've heard that expression. You've used that expression before. What, what exactly does that mean? Well, when she was saying that, she, she's saying, I, I, you're having to do this all on your own. I'm not able to help at all. I, 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 I'm just adding a weight, I'm adding a challenge, I'm adding difficulty, I'm adding adversity, but I'm not helping at all. I'm not just weight, I'm dead weight. When the writer of Hebrews says, and call, God through him calls us to cast aside sin, again, that's the easiest thing to identify. What's more difficult are the things that hinder us, that so easily ensnare us. These are things that are dead weight, that in and of themselves are not necessarily wrong, but they add, this, that they add weight to our lives that don't help us with the process of taking serious what it is that God has called us to. Now, my, my hope is that, that you're listening to what I'm saying, but this is my encouragement. As I am listening, as you are listening, it is my hope that God, through the power of His Spirit, is beginning to show you some things in your life, things that I may not know about, others around you may not know about, that, that are not intrinsically, in and of themselves, wrong, yet they are operating like boat anchors on your life. I mean, for some of you, it may be that there's a person's face who comes to mind because they are a hindrance to you. For others, maybe it's entertainment choices. For others, maybe it's athletics. Maybe it's some form of technology, smartphone, internet. Something is a hindrance to you. As God is showing that to you, he's doing so for good reason. Because he's got for you some big goals. He wants you not just to have a good start, he wants you to be able to stay on program. And if you are, I, and I are ever going to not just simply get with, but stay on program, we're going to have to get rid of the dead weight. We have to get rid of the dead weight. But the passage continues. And not only are we to get rid of the dead weight, we must focus in the right direction. Focus in the right direction. He says, let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, 
who, after all, he says, is the source and perfecter of our faith. When, it, when he says to keep our eyes on Jesus, obviously this is a, a metaphor to say your focus needs to be towards Christ. The, the, the ultimate focus in your life, if you're going to stay on program, has got to be on Jesus. Well, what exactly does that look like? Um, we have a pretty big yard and if you've got a big yard, you've got a lot of grass to cut. And if you've got a lot of grass to cut, you need a big mower. So we've got a big mower. And I am not just interested merely in getting the grass cut. I also want it to be striped. And so if you're not aware, how you stripe a lawn is that you, you go in one direction, you turn around and come in the opposite direction and keep doing that, and that creates the striped pattern. You've, there's tons of yards, tons of uh, commercial properties. You, you'll, you can see all around town, all across the country, the, the, these landscaped lawns where there's uh, and, and yards where these, these lines are going back and forth. And you tend to think, you know, that looks pretty good, but it only looks good if the lines are straight. I mean, because if, if it looked like this, you'd be like, man, that, that's a hot mess. I mean, th that looks terrible. It looks good when the lines are straight, but how exactly do you cut those lines straight? Because there's not like a lane. I mean, you don't come out there with chalk and, and, and mark, uh, and you don't drop a, a chalk line to be able to, to draw and have and be able to be guided by a straight line from point A to point B. Thankfully, it's not rocket science. What it involves very simply is you getting your mower to the line that you want to begin, and then you look off in the distance where you're going to need to stop and turn around, and you find something over there that doesn't move. It could be a tree. It could be a garden gnome. It could be a big rock. It could be a pedestal for the cable or phone service. It could be anything. You find something that doesn't move, and then what you do is you laser focus, and you start mowing towards it. Now, you may be able to glance one way or the other, but here's the trick. If you focus on anything else, you veer off course. If you, if you look even, at, if you're just paying attention to the line you last mowed, I'm telling you, you'll wind up with a crooked line. It is only when you have a fixed point of reference off in the distance that you're able to stay on course. It is exactly that concept that the writer of Hebrews is calling us to make that, that we have an ultimate focus a God a savior whose example does not move and I am headed towards that now, now get me and I understand this reality that that's not the only attention grabbing thing that we can experience in life there's lots of things that require our attention. We have, we have a lot of children that require attention. You have a job that requires attention. You have doctor's visits and health challenges. You have bills that have to be paid. There's cars that break. There's all kinds of stuff that require attention. I'm not suggesting that you just you operate with blinders on, with a laissez-faire attitude towards life, and that you don't care about any of those things, and you just vacate all and go MIA with all areas of responsibility. I'm not saying that at all. What I'm suggesting is you can look away, but let those be glances as you maintain the ultimate focus. It's kind of like when you're driving with your car. You don't stare at the speedometer, but you do look down periodically, Correct? I mean, so you, you look down, and then your eyes get back to where they need to be, hopefully, on the road so that you can keep it in the lane. It is not merely that we need to, to get rid of dead weight, but we've got, absolutely got, to maintain our focus. And our focus has got to be on Jesus. Again, it's not that we can't look away at other things, but as we do, we glance and then come back. Can we be honest and say that we tend to do the opposite? That our ultimate focuses so many times in life tend to be on our jobs, on our kids, on our work, on our bills, on our health. Now, you fill in the blank. Our, so many times our focus tends to be on those things and every once in a while we'll happen to glance heavenward. Oh, I'll entertain a spiritual thought for a moment. If that remains mine and your M.O., if that, if that remains our standard mode of operation, how we consistently work, well, 
we're going to have a lot of starts, but we'll never be able to stay on program. You got to drop the dead weight. You got to focus in the right direction. And the last thing the writer of Hebrews communicates is this you've got to brace for impact. Brace for impact. We're called to run with endurance the race that is set before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the source, the perfecter of our faith. That's a reminder of this reality. You came to have a relationship with the Lord because ultimately of everything God did. I said earlier in a prayer, the only thing that we brought to the table was our sin. The only thing that we brought to the, to the relationship was our mess, our brokenness. He's the one that decided, I want them to know me. He's the one that offered the sacrifice. He is the one that reaches out. He is the one that invites. He is the one that is the author of our faith. And if we are to remain in him, it is not because of what we do. It's because of what he does. And here's the question. If, if God is the one that did everything for me to be able to come to know him, at what point does it cease to be about what he does and about what I do? It, it, it doesn't. It doesn't. He has to remain the focus. He's the author, the perfecter of our faith. But then he says, For the joy that lay before him, Jesus endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And he says again in verse 3, Consider him who endured such hostilities from sinners against himself. Why in the world would the writer of Hebrews at this point start talking about the, the suffering that Jesus endured? Well, I, I think for one thing, to remind this group of Jewish Christians hey, um, you're in some pretty good company. You're experiencing suffering? Well, so did, so, did, so does the one that, that you profess to follow. I mean, if, if you feel like you're on your own personal griddle and the heat is being turned up, you're in good company because Jesus experienced absolutely open, horrible hostility, open rejection, brutal torment. It's an encouragement to those Jewish believers to say, hey, you're in good company. But for us who are much further down the road, 2,000 years later, it's a rem reminder of this reality to us. The more it is that you or I or anyone take seriously trying to live like Christ, the more it is that we, among other things, attempt to be holy as he is holy, the more it is that we will experience what he experienced. Now, that doesn't mean that somebody's going to nail you to the cross, but it does mean that they may make fun of you. It does mean that you could be passed over for some promotions. It does, be that, does mean that you may not get invited to some of the cool opportunities. It does mean that people may uh, call you some names. In some places in the world, it does mean that you could lose some freedoms. And it possibly can mean at some point in the future, whether here or certainly even today in places around the world, it could cost you your life. But he's encouraging them with this reality. Listen, you're in good company. You're in good company. You're suffering. Jesus knows exactly what that is like. And the more that you are like him, the more it is that you are going to experience what he experienced. He says, Consider him who endured such hostility from sinners so that you won't grow weary and give up. This didn't necessarily come as good news at all. What the writer of Hebrews is telling them, um, when you take seriously following Christ, it is, to say the least, it's a bumpy road. There is going to be adversity. There is going to be difficulty. There may very well be out-and-out -out suffering. He's put another way, he's encouraging them to brace for impact. You say, why, why in the world would he do that? Well, among other things, it's to help them to see that they're in good company. They're in the same vein of experience that Jesus was. But I, I believe there's even another reason than that. Uh, for the past couple of years, we've had uh, a membership, uh, an annual pass over to the, uh, uh, the water park here in Greensboro. And what happens is that around Thanksgiving, they have these Black Friday specials, and you can get a season pass for essentially what it costs to get a one-day ticket. And it's cheaper for us than joining any pool anywhere that we have found. And so that, that's where we have gone. And uh, over the time that we have been going there, I, I have ridden, I think virtually every, I think every ride there I have been on at one point or another. 
And there, there's one of them that I have ridden once and I do not anticipate to ride again. It's called the Twin Twisters. And what it is, it's the tallest ride um, over at Wet n' Wild. And what you do is, is, for one thing, you've got to climb like a million stairs. And like, who wants to do that, right? And so you go up all of these stairs, and I'm not sure exactly how high it is, but you go flight after flight after flight after flight of stairs. And you get finally to the top, and then when it's your turn, it's this, it's this big black tube that you're going to slide in. And it kind of corkscrews and does twists and turns, and finally uh, it exits I think I did look it up. It's 76 feet from top to bottom, but it's like a 300-foot course that it sends you with all sorts of corkscrews and twists and turns. Anyway, I, I rode that for the first time uh, a few years ago, and I have not ridden it since. And it is not because I'm afraid. It's not because it's like, ooh, this is so scary. The, the reason I, I have no interest in riding this again is because you are in a black tube. And you know what you can see in a black tube? Nothing. And so by the time you get to the end, you feel like you have been in a washing machine. You just, you, you just been beat unmercifully. And, and the reason for that is because you can't see what lies ahead, and so stuff just keeps happening, and you could not brace for it. You know, if the tube were light, and, and they've got other rides there where, the, where light shines in, and you're able to see, oh, ahead, we're getting ready to go to the right, you're able to kind of acclimate, and it doesn't come as such a brutal shock to you. In fact, sometimes it doesn't even shake you around because you know it's coming. It doesn't mean that you're able to avoid it, but it does mean this. It's easier knowing that it's coming. It is that same principle the writer of Hebrews is helping not only a first century audience, but a 21st century audience understand, and that's this. The more it is that you take seriously what God has called us to, the more it is that you're going to experience, this is not easy. There is going to be difficulty. There is going to be adversity, and there is going to be pushback. Brace for the impact. Know that it's coming. That way, when it does come, when someone does say something that's hurtful, when that adverse experience is encountered by you, you're not like, oh, no, the sky is falling. What am I going to do? You knew it was going to come. You have braced for impact. The writer of Hebrews was able to be used by God to encourage a group of people who had had a really good start to have a really strong finish. Again, as I said at the outset, it is my sincere hope that there are ways in which that God has spoken to you about living a life that's different, living a life that's set apart, living a life that's characterized by making right moral choices. It's my hope that there are things that God has been showing you that need to change. It's my hope sincerely that some of you have already begun the process. You've gotten on program advancing towards that goal. But bear this in mind. God is not interested simply in the sprint. He's interested in the marathon. This is not a short race. Yes, it's great to get on the program, but it is vitally important to stay on program. So where does this meet you this morning? For some of you, it comes as, again, an invitation to start. Honestly, I believe that there are more than a few here in this room, not because of any particular thing I know. I'm just certain based on numbers that there are some for whom this whole Christian life is little more than a game. This is, this is kind of what you do on Sundays. You go to church. And so, God, I'll give you an hour or two on Sundays, but the, the rest of the time, that's my time. And you're getting ready to leave this place, and we're getting ready to be on your time again. And, and being holy as he is holy, your life looks like a lot of things, but it doesn't look like that. This comes as an invitation for you to start taking this serious. Because following Jesus is not a game. We're talking about things that have eternally consequential stakes. For others who have been saying, you know what, Michael, I, I appreciate this today and because I, already I've been struggling with this because I've made some decisions and choices that are they're, they're kind of putting me back on path, but already I'm struggling staying on it. And I needed what God is saying today 
to reinforce this. And there's some changes going forward I need to make even today. Maybe there's some dead weight that God is showing you that you need to drop so that your focus can be where it needs to be. Maybe God is showing you it is not only possible in a general sense, it is absolutely possible for you to have a real relationship with him that will change the rest of your life and all of eternity. And he's showing you this is an invitation for you to begin that journey. Everything that God is saying to us today demands a response. Not always a response necessarily kneeling at this altar, though it may be that that's something God is burdening you to do. It may be that it's something that we're, God is showing you something, you want somebody to pray with you, and we'll be glad to do that, but it may not be that even. But that right where you are, there are individual choices and decisions he's calling you to make. Not only so that you can get on program, so that you can stay on the program. So he's showing you what you should do. The question is, will you? Will you bow your heads with me? I can stand here and list a ton of hypotheticals with the hope that maybe, somehow, some way, that describes your experience. I can paint a lot of little different pictures and say, you know, if this, if this is you, if this is you, if this is you. And I'm not interested in, in that game at all. I just really believe that God takes his word and personalizes it in ways that nothing and no one else can. And I don't simply believe it's possible. I believe in this place today that God has personalized his truth for you. And he's helped you to see things that need to happen. You have a choice now to make whether you're going to do what he's called. So what are you going to say to him? My encouragement is whether it's at this altar, it's in your pew, it's with my help or that of someone else that you do it. Whatever it is. Why? Because ultimately what we're talking about really, really matters. Father, we want to say thank you for taking truth that applies to everyone and helping us to see how it applies to me. How it applies to each of us individually. And you not only are able, I believe, in multiplied different instances, you have shown people today some things that are true of them and their circumstance that maybe no one else knows. Certainly things that I'm not aware of. And you're inviting them to make decisions and choices that either start or continue the program. Anything you say once, you mean, but anything you say twice is to really underscore, to say it is vitally important. You said to be holy as you are holy. I pray, God, that we make choices during this time now that say we want to take that serious. Not just for now, not just for the next couple of weeks, but we want to stay on the program. So, God, as you are inviting us to make decisions, I pray that we will follow with obedience. We say it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask